Now, I don't know. Uh, I was in high school so long ago. Do schools still have study hall, or did you, did you guys have a study hall we're in school? Did you, did you do that? Like two or three of you? Okay, study hall. Now, did you have detention hall when you were in school? Did anybody have? Okay, the, the reason I asked was the story I'm getting ready to tell, I have thought all week, I can't remember if I was in study hall when this happened or if I was in detention hall because I spent time in both. Uh, so, and, but in, in study hall or detention hall, I honestly cannot remember which it was. There was a, uh, we were sitting there, and in the audit, where they did it at my school, you sat in the auditorium of the, the, of the school, and they had everybody divided up so you couldn't talk to each other, spread out, and you weren't supposed to do anything but uh, study. You know, that's what you would do. Couldn't talk, couldn't do anything. But sitting right down from me was a guy who went through school all the way, from first grade all the way. <clears throat> His name was Roger Sands, and I just remember it just so clearly. We're there, and I only had one teacher in the room watching the whole room. And we're there, and I, I'm sure Roger started it by throwing a piece of paper at me. So we're watching, you know, and we're watching this one teacher. If we could get his head turned, man, throwing paper at each other and find anything we can throw at each other. You know. And so this is going on for a long time. And then finally I noticed the teacher walked out uh, of, the, of, of the room, and like a lot of auditoriums, you know, you could enter in another door. And so he came in another door where Roger's back was to him. And, but I could see him, so I'm straightened up. I become an angel all of a sudden. And Roger throws something and hits me right in the head, and I'm just like, <laughs> you know. And, uh, and so he's, I got you, I got you, and all this stuff. And the teacher's standing behind him the whole time. So he just goes, it takes him out, you know, so we either, he either got detention after that or he got more detention hall after that. I can't really remember what it was. But it's important to be able to see your surroundings, to know what's out there and surrounding you. I thought about that today or this week when I was reading this story uh, in the Old Testament. Let me give you some background on this story. Uh, the king or the nation of Aram, A-R-A-M, Aram, they were at war with Israel, and the king of Aram, he was trying to get the better of Israel, so he would send his troops to plant a trap this way, but God would reveal to the prophet, uh, the prophet Elisha everything that the king was doing, and so he would tell the king of Israel, hey, there's a trap set for you here, don't go there, and it just went on and on and on. And so the king of Aram just got really frustrated, and he calls all of his officials and generals in. He said, okay, which one of you is the traitor? Because this is not coincidence that this many times. And they said, none of us are traitors, but there is a prophet. There's a prophet in Israel named Elisha, and he knows what you say in private. And he's just telling the king, but somehow he knows. And so he becomes very angry, and he says, I want you to go out and find where he is, and I want him brought to me, and I want to kill him. And so they send out spies. They find out that Elisha is in a city called Dothan. And so they go there. During the night, they surround the city there that, that, uh, that Elisha is in. And that's where I want to pick up in 2 Kings uh, chapter 6, verses 15 through 17. It says this. <clears throat> When the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh, my Lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. You know, you can imagine getting up and walking outside, and you just see the soldiers in the hills. I mean, they're surrounding the city. And, he, and Elisha says this in verse 16. He says, don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. But there's nothing but the army of the king of Aram out there. Verse 17 says this, And Elisha prayed, O Lord, open his eyes so he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. These were the angel warriors of God that they couldn't see, the army of Aram could not see. But he said they were surrounded by uh, Elisha, angels and chariots of fire. And he prays, he says, Lord, open 
his eyes. He wanted the servant to see what he could see. You know, how does that, how is that going to change anything? Well, you know how it is. When you can only see your problems and see the bad things that's going on and you see nothing but hopelessness and doom and you're ready to give up, uh, you think that you can never recover, you can't move forward, and you see, and all of a sudden you see that there's someone out there greater than your problems and they have you sur surrounded. That changes everything. And I'm sure it changed everything for the servant of Elisha. And I'm sure you can easily see your problems a lot easier than you can see the solutions to your problems. I know that's what happens to me when something goes wrong in my life or there's something pending or a doom. You know, that just seems like it, it, it takes your mind and you, that's what you think about. But if you can stop and refocus and realign with Scripture, you go, yeah, that's a problem. But my God is so much bigger. Problems are brought right back down to size. I couldn't help but think about this as we've been, you know, talking about uh, David and Psalm 23 so much. I can't help but think it's, that's exactly what David would want. is for us to have our eyes opened as we look at all the things that are wrong. But our eyes are open to see that God is there all along. Because David had experienced everything. He was, a, he was a shepherd. He was a warrior. He was a king. Uh, he was a fugitive. He had seen a lot of bad things. But God was always tremendously clear in David's eyes. The last two weeks, we have read uh, the 23rd Psalm to begin our, our message. Now, I'm going to ask if you're physically able, we're going to stand together again and just read the 23rd Psalm. Let's stand. <clears throat> the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Thank you. you may be seated. This is our third week in our series, Don't Give the Enemy a Seat at Your Table. And this was not an original thought of, of mine or Eric's. This is based on a, a wonderful book that Louis Giglio wrote uh, of this title, where someone had sent him a text to remind him, do not let the devil get control of your mind and change your, your purpose and your intent in life. And this was all based on uh, the 23rd Psalm. And uh, this, this theme, this idea is built on two thoughts that we're trying to go through the whole month. At one is Psalm 23 is just an invitation from God. Come, let me be your shepherd. Follow me. Let, let me guide you through life. And two, it's this. It's about winning the battle of the mind. That we do not give the, the devil a seat at our table where he can take our thoughts under control and guide us in the ways, negative ways, sinful ways, and take us away from being led by the shepherd. Now, Elisha's prayer was for his servant. He said, Lord, open his eyes so that he may see. That's what our hope today is. I just want to look at two things and hope that we can get our eyes open to see these things as we battle in life not to give the enemy a seat at our table. The first one is this. See the real problem. See that sin is the real problem. Immediately following Jesus' baptism uh, in Matthew chapter 4, it says this in verse 1. It says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. And last week, if you remember, we read from James where it says that God does not tempt Anyone, but we are tempted when our, by our own evil desires, our thoughts, 
we entertain the thought and we're dragged away into sin. Thought gives birth to sin. But from this verse today, we see, we learn at least two things. One, that is the devil who does the tempting. The second thing is this, is no one is above being tempted. It says here, even Jesus was tempted. Now maybe the best way for us to say this is that the first thought is not a sin. The first thing that is put before us is not necessarily a sin. It's not a sin to recognize it, to know it. When Jesus was in the wilderness, like it talks about in Matthew 4, it says he was out, <clears throat> he was out there and the devil was throwing temptations right at him, right with one after the other. And in this account, <clears throat> he particularly mentions three of, the, three of the temptations. The first one, well, let me say this before I get to that first temptation. Jesus was aware of the temptation. He knew that he was being tempted, but he did not entertain that thought any further. That's where it stopped. He would not entertain the thought. I think maybe the best uh, way to, to look at this is that first temptation. The first temptation, remember, Jesus has been fasting for 40 days, so we know he is hungry. We know that. And the devil tempts him with food. Anybody understand what being tempted with food is? So Jesus understood the temptation. He was hungry. He understood the temptation was, hey, here's food. But Jesus would not entertain the thought of taking food from the devil, and he would not entertain the thought of going by the devil's timeline. It was the timeline of being in the wilderness, being tempted by all these things, and God the Father would tell him when that time was over. So he wouldn't entertain that thought. The danger is not in the first thought, the first idea that is put before us, the first sight or the first desire, but where it goes from there. And that's the, the thing that we need to understand is that the danger of unchecked thoughts, where it takes us. When our thoughts, when our desires, our feelings combine with temptation, a deadly spiral begins. That's where sin begins. When we say in our minds, well, it wouldn't hurt to just listen to what he has to say. It wouldn't hurt just to give a thought to what he's talking about. So we just slide the, ta the chair out and say, well, sit down and tell me a little more about this. And that's where the dangerous, dangerous beginnings of sin is where we start to entertain those thoughts. There was an article popped up uh, on the internet this week. I, I can't remember, I was on Yahoo or something. And the, the title popped up. And you know how they do it. They try to uh, get you to read the article. And it, was, it said 15 things that, uh, I can't remember if it said poor people or people who are struggling with money still spend money on. And I always had some strong feelings about that. You know, even if we don't have money, we still spend money on those things. And I wanted to see if their ideas match with mine. So I started reading it. And it was a, yeah, that's something. I agree with that. Yeah. But then it got to a place in the article. If you would like to read further, subscribe. And I said, oh, man. And I didn't want to subscribe, so I didn't get to finish reading the article. But isn't that just the way sin is? The temptation is? I'll give you a little bit for free. I'll get you thinking. I'll get your idea. And then maybe I'll get you to pay the cost. The next thing you know, you're drug into something. Hey, this is a good place to ask the question simply. Do you keep going back? Do you keep going back to the same sins? Do you keep revisiting the places in your mind, the places in your life, and you just repeat the same things? And the whole time you're hoping, you're hoping that it's going to be a different outcome this time. Now this is a pretty gross scripture, but since it's in the Bible, I can say it. <laughs> if it's in the Bible, you can say it. Proverbs 26, 11 says this. As a dog returns to its vomit, so a fool repeats his folly. Now go home and give your dog a nice kiss all on the mouth when you go. We said we keep going back. We just keep going back to the things that's, that's dragging us down. We keep repeating. 
I read a pretty good, I thought it was a pretty good explanation of why we do those things. And one of the reasons is that many of us understand what generational sin is, generational. I do the things that my daddy did, that my grandfather did, and everything I've ever seen in life is this is how you act as a man, or maybe you're, this is what my mama did, and that's how my, her grandmother treated her, and you're going like that, and you just, you're just repeating what has been shown to you for generations. And you kind of go, well, how would you expect me to act? It's the only thing I've ever seen. Generational sin, and we go back to it. Not all sin is that. Some are things just a personal sin that we've, we kind of got caught up in. Uh, your family, your mom, your dad, nobody else did. But we get caught up in it and we keep going back. Oh, the sin, I really, really was interested in another category, the familiar sin. We go back to what's familiar. That's, a, that's our nature. It's to go back to what we're familiar with. How many times have you, have you, you done it or, or you know people that says, I'm turning over a new leaf. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quit smoking. I'm going to quit doing this. I'm going to give up this habit. I'm going <clears> to <throat> stop this addiction. I'm, just, I'm not going to talk that way anymore. I'm not going to act that way and treat people this way. <clears throat> and everything is going good to start with. Then you hit a bump in the road. Or you might say it's a pothole in the road. Or you hit what seems like to you as a boulder in the road. Something that upsets and you go right back to that familiar behavior. You hadn't lost your temper. You hadn't called. You hadn't spoke with this language. You hadn't picked up the bottle. You hadn't done anything. But man, when something happens that just brings back the familiar comfort part of that sin, you go right back to it. Mike Tyson was a boxer, and in his prime, he was just simply unbeatable. But every time there was a boxer, his next match, they would say, well, they have a strategy to beat him. And Mike Tyson was asked about that, and I wish I could talk like Mike Tyson. Uh, a little bit of lisp, uh, you know, <laughs> and a little bit of high voice. But they asked Mike Tyson about that. They have a strategy for him, and he said, he said everybody has a strategy. Everybody has a plan. Until somebody punches them in the mouth. Boy, is that true? Until that speed bump comes, that hard blow in life, that something happens, and bang, we go right back to what we've been doing that never worked all along. Here's something we need to open our eyes to as well sin is never the solution. No matter how many times we tell ourselves, if I do this, I'm going to feel better, it's going to make things better, it just doesn't work. Sin is never the solution. Go back, I want to go to another Proverbs. Proverbs 14, 12, and 13 says this. There is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. Even the laughter, the heart, even in laughter the heart may ache and joy may end in grief. Boy, if that's not an accurate description of how thinking sin is going to be the solution. We, we go after something. You know, whatever reason, we go after something, at, and it just doesn't turn out well. Maybe your background was that you, was just, you were never loved, and you feel like you just came from a background that you were never loved, never had anybody to love, and people didn't love you back, and all of a sudden, here's a relationship. And you go after this person, you go along with this person, and you know in the back of your mind, and people have tried to warn you and say, this isn't good, but you go after it anyway. And instead of all of a sudden you finding out that you're greatly loved, you find out that the, the, the problem was still there. You just have a more complicated life now because of this person or a child that's come from this relationship or whatever. You get a bad review of, at work, and you tell your boss off. You still got the bad review at work. Now you just got to look for a job, too. Somebody treats you badly, says something, some, something that really, really hurts you or really knocks you down, and you go back, and you, you fall back to an old familiar sin, and you go out, and you, you start drinking, you get drunk, you do whatever, whatever it is, and you go out, and you know what? You still had the person hurt you. That didn't change a thing. Now you got to deal with the hangover or what you did that you got to pay the price for that while you were 
why you'd open the bottle. So we go back and we keep clicking on the internet pages. We keep opening a bottle. We keep telling, we keep telling people off and none of our problems go away. We just have more problems because sin is never the solution. Open our eyes to that. Go back to the Elisha story that we, we started out with. The enemy, the, the servant could already see the enemy, correct? He could see the enemy. And you know what? That's not a problem. All through the New Testament, all through the Bible, the teachings of Jesus, the teachings of Paul, Peter, all the way through, they're telling us to be aware of the enemy around us. I mean, we've been talking about this for three weeks. Be aware who's trying to sit down at your table. So it's not wrong to be able to see the enemy. We're warned to do that. The problem is, is if that's all we see, then we miss the solution. Because it's a lot of times that what we plan on doing is just, uh, is, is just fight the problems in our life by fight just by fighting sin. So here's the thing. The second thing I want us to see is open my eyes so I can see God. Open my eyes so I can see the chariots of fire. He wanted his servant to see God at work. He wanted them to be able to see that God is already working on the solution here. And God was working to overshadow any of the problems that Elisha and the servant may have. And just as real as Elisha and his servant could see the angels, the, ar- the, the, the chariots of fire, that God was working to overshadow his problems, God's doing the same for you and I. Now, I may not see the angels, may not ever see the chariots of fire, but I can rest assured that they're there, that God is surrounding us, working in our lives. In Romans chapter 7, Paul gives that, what I say, famous description of struggle with sin. Where he says, you know, why do I do the things that I do not want to do? Why is it I want to do good, but I find myself doing bad all over again? And he just says, I don't understand the things I do, why I keep going back. And if this is the Apostle Paul saying that, there's a lot of room for me to struggle with some of those things. And right at the end is the conclusion of, of that, He says this in Romans chapter 8, starting with verse 1. He says, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because Christ Jesus saw the, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. So he's saying, I want... We need to see, Paul is saying, I need to see, you need to see what God has done through his son, Jesus Christ. That there's now no condemnation. Sin and death have been defeated. I may still have, and I still do, have the capacity to sin. But I do not have to be controlled by sin. I do not have to be condemned by sin. I still have to fight against these things. But we do not have to control. We do not have to give in to those things. And for most of us, we need to understand that we need to take on a new identity. That yes, we see the problems, we see the the, the, the devil, we see the sin, we see it all, but we need to see a new identity because we cannot win this battle by just focusing on developing better habits and praying for forgiveness every time we sin. We need to be able to see past that and see God in all of this because that's where the deliverance is going to come from. That's, that's where the change is going to come from is that he empowers us through that. New identity. Winning the battle for our mind begins with, begins with uniting with Jesus Christ. That we realize that God wants to change our story. We say that a lot around here. God, want, God wants to change our story. You may not like the story of your life to this point, but you can change it. Or better yet, God can change it. If you'll just unite with him, 
and let him work in your life. When we choose to join him at the table and say, I'll follow you. And I really do believe we need to start memorizing some things and putting them on paper and reminding ourselves, putting them on the mirror or whatever, that things like it tells us in Isaiah that God knows my name. God knows my name. That's how much he cares about me. God, my God goes before me. That tells us that Isaiah. My God goes before me. You can't walk into any room. You can't walk into any situation in life that God hasn't already been there. That God's not walking ahead of you into that. Jesus, you know, remember it tells us, it's, no temptation has come upon you. It's not common to man. God's right there. That's why he said, I walk, yeah, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. You're with me. We need to remember that. God goes before us. We remember Philippians. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Through Christ. Through Christ. He also told Paul, warned, or gave us the, the admonition in Romans 8. My present sufferings pale in comparison to the future glory that God has stored up for me. And no matter what we're going through right now and no matter how, how sad or bad it is, it pales in comparison. No war, he says in Isaiah, no weapon formed against me will prosper. No plan that the devil comes up with, your enemies come up with, can bring you down. None. In Romans 8, it says that I am a child of God. He's, he's my father. That's who we go to. And probably the one we need to get up every Monday morning and read is the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead now lives in me. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in me, the Holy Spirit. What a message for us today. Lord, open our eyes to see sin for what it is and who it comes from, but to also see God at work and what he, uh, what he affords us. Now, I don't know if you're <clears throat> a big sports fan or not, but being a sports fan that I am, I've watched a lot of my favorite teams in the first half look terrible. And you go, oh man, we're losing tonight. But they go into halftime and they make what they call adjustments. They go in and it's not just drink some water and rest. They go in and the coaches, whether it's basketball or football, they go in and they get their groups of players together and say, now this is what they're doing. This is how they're winning. But what we're going to do is we're going to make this adjustment and we're going to make it tougher on them. And the defense and the offense are doing the same thing. And they come out, and so many times you see this, they come out at a, after the half, and, man, they, they turn it on. It's because they made adjustments of how the devil or how the opposing team was doing that to them. And our lives are nothing but Seasons of life, half times and quarters or whatevers, and we need to make adjustments as well. We just make adjustments as we go through life. And you know how it was when you were very little and you started the school. They said, well, now you're in school. You've got to do things differently. And then when you got a little older, they'd say, well, now high school's different. You have to adjust. And then when you went to college and you said, man, that's a huge adjustment because it's a lot harder than I thought it was. And you learned i got to get up on my own. And you know, it's, it's all those things. You made adjustments. And then when you got out and got a real job, you said, man, i gotta, I got to get up and go to work. i got to pay attention to what's going on. i got to do a good job. Then you get married, and it's not just dating. And you, you meet somebody, and you date, and that's an adjustment of how your thinking is. This is somebody I'm looking for, not just for a good time. I'm looking for somebody I'll spend my life with. And you make adjustments. And then the children come along. And all of a sudden, something happens. You say, I want them to know God. And church becomes a reality again. I need to get back in church. And those are nothing but adjustments that we make in life. That's what life is about. It's about making adjustments. At our shop church, uh, just the study with men <clears throat> last month, I told this story. And I said, my dad, from probably about the age of 
probably 14, 15, until his late 60s, was under the influence of alcohol. My dad was an alcoholic. And what I meant by saying that to these guys was, did my dad drink every day? No. Was he drunk all the time? No. But he was under the influence. Because all that lifetime through that, he could not hear the gospel. Because he heard it multiple times. He could not see that the life of a Christian and being a part of a wonderful church was a better way of life. Because we had, we had church in our lives, and we had church family, and he saw that, but he just couldn't see it. You know? So I say he was under the influence all of his life until he stopped drinking. And after a couple of years, that same gospel that he had heard off and on his whole life, it made sense. And he gave his life to Christ. The same, same church that he wanted nothing to do with became his family. And he would come to church every Sunday and love the people, and they loved him right back. Because he got out from underneath the influence. Now, whatever that influence is, I'm not saying it's just alcohol or whatever it is, but if you're under the influence, if somebody's sitting at your table and influencing what you do in life and how you think and how you process, then you're never going to see the good. You're not going to see it. Salvation is from Jesus Christ. I'm not talking about earning our way to heaven. I'm talking about, I mean, that's the grace, the blood, the forgiveness. It's all Jesus Christ. But I'm talking about being able to see that being able to experience that, and be able to move forward with your life that you see all the good that's in this world, that's in this church, until you get out from the influence of that sin. Whatever it is, you're just not going to see it. So what do you think the question today is? Let's, let's, get, let's make some adjustments. Let's get rid of that person who's sitting at our table that's influencing us and follow the shepherd.